Much of the talk ahead of September's independence referendum has been about whether Scotland's economy is stronger as part of the UK or as part of an independent country. Well, the pro-UK parties say an independent Scotland couldn't share the pound. Pro-independence campaigners dismiss that as bluff and bluster. But as our economics correspondent Coletta Smith has been finding out, recent history in Ireland shows that things aren't quite that black and white. <laughs> Ireland has been independent from Britain for more than 90 years, but have a listen to this. It was an accepted fact of life, like the weather, that economically we were not independent. Professor Brian Lucy from Trinity College Dublin. The economic and political history of Ireland have taken very different routes, and when it comes to the prospect of Scottish independence, there's a lot we can learn. First off, when the Irish state was being created, the economies were so intertwined that the Irish decided to peg their new currency to the pound. One love, one life. Meaning one Irish punt was always worth exactly one British pound. The concept has been talked about a lot in reference to the Scottish referendum. It's called sterlingisation. Here's Professor Brian Lucy again. It was made for very pragmatic reasons, the deep interrelationships of the two countries in terms of trade, the deep interrelationships of the two countries in terms of the money markets between Dublin and London. So it was very much a bit of a no-brainer, really, to stay with Sterling. Was there any political backlash to the fact that Ireland was sticking with the UK economically? No. People are ultimately pragmatic. And the Irish War of Independence and Civil War were about the political mastery of the country. When you're a small country, and when you're tied to a larger country or a larger region through trade, through history, through blood, through money, you aren't independent. And those trade connections are still just as strong today, with two million euros worth of goods flowing across the Irish Sea each week, including half of the sweets from the jelly bean factory on the outskirts of Dublin, where they make more jelly beans than you could possibly dream of. Well, we're manufacturing over 12 to 14 million jelly beans a day with a population of 4 million people. If the Irish market was our only market, every man, woman and child would be eating an awful lot of jelly beans every single day. So we have to look at, at the UK as an extension of our home market. We import uh, quite a significant amount of uh, ingredients, for example, from the UK. All our core ingredients, sugar, glucose, starch, would all come in from the UK. So the incredibly strong relationship between the UK and Ireland meant that as a new country, Ireland didn't really have much choice about which currency to use and their economy just had to ride the waves of the UK inflation rate. But it also meant that the UK had to step in when the Irish economy needed a bailout. Here's the Chancellor George Osborne just four years ago announcing that extra £8 billion Irish bailout. It is clearly in Britain's interest that we have a growing Irish economy and a stable Irish banking system. By considering a bilateral loan, we are recognising these deep connections between our two countries. We're one, but we're not the same. We get to carry each other, carry each other. If economic independence isn't really achievable between Ireland and the UK, then that's even more the case between Scotland and the rest of the UK. That could mean an independent Scotland would just have to be subject to the waves of UK inflation and interest rates, but it also means that the UK may not be able to stand on the sidelines if the Scottish economy did get into trouble. As they did in Ireland, they may have to weigh in as a lender of last resort whether or not they want to. Coletta Smith reporting there.